there's a microphone coming for you so that your colleagues up the back can hear. Yep. And, uh, and Rona, you're welcome to chip in as well. There was a case um, a little while back of a sea container of fertiliser that landed on a farm in Condobolin that had got through all of the uh, checks at the borders and that kind of thing. Um, and obviously that set off some alarm bells at a number of levels because the sea container was stuck there and the importer didn't have the resources to sort of um, send it back to China where it had come from. Um, I was just wondering, under these changes, um, in terms of a test case that you might want to talk to us about, uh, are we going to see a repeat of that kind of thing? Have there, has there been changes come about? Was there an investigation and a conclusion reached on that issue? <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yeah, look, I, I think um, one of the key things about... So the, the story is that there was um, fertiliser that was declared as fertiliser, um, but of a certain kind. Um, obviously, there was an issue with the documentation. One container, there was actually many, many containers. Some of them got through and some of them didn't. Um, they came in different consignments. When the, the importer... Uh, opened them up. The importer actually bought this, and there's a lesson in here for everybody who wants to import something, off a website that wasn't government approved in China, so buyer beware, and managed it through the process with a broker and it was misdeclared. So, so to be frank, when we talk about regulation, we talk about regulating people who provide the information that we need to do our job. And that wasn't the case here. Um, that uh, for those who don't know the, the end of the story, yes, it got through, and what it was was actually soil. And soil is a, 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 it's not really a commodity, it's a thing that has one of the highest biosecurity risks for us because it has pathogens and weeds and all sorts of other rubbish in it, and this did. And it was uh, seized, and yes, the, the particular importer, remember, importer's responsibility if we decide it's an illegal or prohibited import to get rid of it, and in his case, um, shipping lines, a and a whole bunch of people, Shipping Australia came together and funded the return of it to China. So he was lucky, um, very lucky, because the, the cost to those industries and obviously the, the government kicked in a bit as well, uh, was very high. Well, could it happen again? Yes, I'm not going to beat around the bush and say, um, I'm not going to pretend that the, that the management systems that all of us in regulation have are 100%. Um, it, it relies on honesty and integrity of people in the system. It relies on the classification of material. For us, it relies on the quality of data that we hold and how we mine that. And there's no, we've never been secret in the fact that our IT systems and the, and the sort of data that we can access and use in a savvy way is a little bit last century. <laughs> and we're doing quite a bit to actually tidy that up. It relies on, uh, in, in, in that sort of story, the customs brokers and freight forwarders. Uh, demonstrating goodwill as well. And then it relies on the border agencies in this case. It relies on uh, the, the competent authority overseas to certify the goods. Uh, there were issues overseas. There's no doubt that some of the press would have told you that there were issues with the exporter and with the Chinese government and their relationship. It was a horrible story. Could it happen again? Yes, because all of those things need to line up in a clean way. Our job, I guess, is to actually continue to assure that those things can line up. Um, have we worked with the Chinese government on that matter? Yes. Do we do that when we see other certification, not just with China, with anyone that's not quite up to par? Yes. Um, have we made a change in the system? Yes. We actually have a much higher focus. Two learnings for us in that was the way in ICON that the, the fertiliser was classified. Again, it's not unlike the plastic, uh, plastic bags for cocoa uh, imports. Um, the way that fertiliser comes through the system is a lot different to what it was. That fertiliser was in bags. Smaller bags had been seen as lower risk, they're not anymore. Um, I think the second thing is that this fellow, this particular farmer, was a new importer. And what we've learned from that is we need to give more time to new importers, more customer service, if you like, to manage them safely into the system. Is that good? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Goodness, it is now. Uh, Gary Fitt from CSIRO uh, Biosecurity Flagship. And uh, a question or comment for Lisa. And I guess I'd like the battleship analogy. I think we will fit into that very well. 
I share your concerns about the capability audit process that we've gone through. And one of the real concerns here is there's so much, as you said, there's so much change and churn and growing opportunity for different types of science to contribute here. And as part of the audit process, for example, in, in the One Health area, we're establishing a, a One Health theme. And one of our areas of focus will be in the sort of foresighting and predictive virology, you might call it. That's going to entail us redirecting a lot of other capability that at the moment we wouldn't say was biosecurity R&D capability. Capability in modelling, in social science, into the biosecurity spectrum. And I think in the auditing process we've gone through, we've really missed a lot of that potential for refocus. Uh, so that's just a comment as much as anything. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's just we, what we need is a responsive innovation sector and um, the amount of attention and resources that has gone into the audit in a way has distracted from the strategic uh, questions and uh, so I think, so I sense that we kind of have been lagging for a couple of years and so it's a different process. Um, I'm not saying I'm against audits but I think we need to think about our capability in a more strategic way and where we want to be heading and that involves a dialogue between government, industry, communities and the, and the research, research providers. I can't, I honestly cannot see you, so if I look like I'm weird, I'm, it's because I have big lights in my face. Anyone else got a question? Go for it. Another microphone down the front. Don't make it squeal this time. Uh, I, this might be a little bit too left of centre, a bit too radical, but we talked about social licence and there is issues in terms of the way that some of these activists are going about their agendas in approaching agriculture. Has there been any serious thought given to the potential of some of these activists perhaps um, taking steps to breach biosecurity in order to um, fulfil their agenda? Um, it's uh, an interesting, as you say, left field question. Um, I think, I think um, there's activists, there's advocates, um, there's people with passions, there's a, a mixture of people that uh, challenge broad social licence issues across a range of things and I think what we've seen in the media a lot is about animal welfare and it's not animal welfare just in live animal exports, it's in uh, production systems, in uh, poultry, in, in uh, piggeries, in abattoirs, it's, it's, it's across the board and it's driven by, um, it's driven by different views. Um, it's fair to say that at the far end of the spectrum you do, you do concern yourself as a leader in biosecurity and I'm sure my colleagues in the States and elsewhere do about whether or not there would be certain behaviours that, um, that went to, uh, to attacking Australia's productivity as well as its reputation. But I, I don't believe it's up that point. It's something we do keep an eye on. Um, I don't believe it's up that point. We have seen um, people behaving in, in very activist ways at, at protests and things like that, but nothing of the nature. That, that you're, you're putting yeah, into. I mean, uh, Greenpeace attacked CSIRO, the GM wheat trials, yeah. and um, they wore hazmat suits, which was basically a theatrical stunt, but yeah. also concealed their identity. But in talking about contamination on that issue, they also spread. You know, if they were genuine about that issue, they wouldn't have then um, looked at uh, taking that material yeah. and, and, and spreading it around. Uh, so, uh, was uh, that look, a warning across your bow? Uh, look, I think it's a, I think it's a, a threat that is on, on, on the, the radar. Um, is it, is it uh, do we actually think that it's going to happen in some percentage terms? No, we don't sit there and assess it that way. We certainly, uh, we certainly are astute to the fact that there are activists at an extreme end um, in all sorts of things affecting government business um, that, that could affect Australia's productivity and reputation and uh, it, it's on the radar, um, but, but we haven't seen evidence to suggest that it's, it's happening. Uh, the other one is where at Fremantle Port, the yep. anti-live ac export activists get on the ships. Yep. They don't know what they're carrying. They don't understand, when you talk about the broader biosecurity yep. and scientific issues, that they could potentially be endangering the health of those animals. And their welfare. Yeah. Do you, have you looked at that? There at has been. Uh, look, I, I have to say, on the animal welfare side, um, and the government's invested a lot of energy and effort, not just into the regulatory systems, but to the relationships, um, the, the minister himself and the department, and, and I know my colleagues in the state governments likewise, engage very heavily 
in dialogue with a range of groups, and they're on a spectrum as well. Um, there are groups that are advocates and there are groups that tend to, to be at the more activist end. Um, and I'm confident that those groups also understand some of those risks. Um, as I say, in all regulatory systems and in all government business, there's extreme behaviour that tends to be illegal. I mean, entering a port through security onto a ship is trespassing and it's illegal. And there are other risks involved in that that go to the human safety of those individuals as well. Um, we're aware of it. We, we have dialogue with the, the, the so-called representative groups, the NGOs that represent some of those issues. Um, we, none of us, whether we're Commonwealth Government, Australian Government, um, State Governments, policing services can control some of that behaviour directly, but we do work together to see how we can actually pull levers to, to minimise it. Yeah. Anyone else? You must ask Paul something interesting because he's like, yeah, awesome, thank you. Jessica, am I working? Am yeah. I on? Yeah. Jessica Swan from ABC. Hi, Paul. I, uh, I definitely mirror Colin's sentiments. It was a really lovely talk. Thanks very much. Uh, when you're talking about the use of language, for example, and, I, and I'm talking about you know English, but when you're going into Indigenous communities, the use of language, even if it is in English, is vitally important. How, to what extent is the concerns and the issues around biosecurity in the community that you live in, uh, to what extent is it lost by the time it gets to Canberra? Um. <laughs> um. Holes, I mean, the, the communication that we have, I mean, one of the things that we do, um, and I suppose I've been a community, community practitioner for a while now, but those relationships that we have um, going into community, remote communities that are on the coastline, um, there's nothing between some of these communities and, and Indonesia or Timor-Leste. Um, so um, I suppose it is around the connection then between the locally based people that can filter information back to Canberra. Um, but also, um, we, we do get a number of people that, that come up from, say, Perth um, or from Canberra. Um, we're just in for the day. And it's like, actually, you need to be here for a month to really understand the complex nature of what happens. I mean, there's some really amazing stuff that's happening um, across Arnhem Land um, through Charles Darwin University and local rangers. So local rangers are actually very, very active. Local Indigenous um, rangers are very, very active um, in surveillance and control um, control of biosecurity issues, so picking up things that they see differently from one year to the next. Oh, we've noticed that there's maybe an increase in neem trees that are starting to grow on, on um, river banks and, and things like that. And um, using technology as well, I know the stuff that's happening in Arnhem Land is that they're actually recording that on handheld um, keypads yeah. as well, which is amazing. So that information can be automatically um, collected um, and instantly sort of downloaded somewhere else. So even though there is a, a um, English might be a third language for some communities that we go into, um, but that language of technology um, exists um, at still, yeah. and that, that's still relevant. Um, and again, it, it is around those, those relationships. It is around, I mean, my, my ear is tuned a little bit to, um, to Creole um, that happens in our communities, but it took me a long time to get there. Yeah. So I might just add to that, Jessica, um, we, in, in DAF in the, the Australian Government Agency, but in partnership with our colleagues in Queensland, the Northern Territory and Western Australia, we share a brilliant relationship with about 32 community groups right across the top end. It's called the Northern Australian Quarantine Service. And what we actually do is contract into those community groups and that they have the handheld devices and they collect survey information for us. They watch for weeds, they watch for insects. Um, they're very good at knowing their own land, obviously. They're very connected to their own land. They do work for land care as well. Um, and for coastal rangers, they look for ghost nets that wash up on the beaches. For us, they're looking for uh, dumped fishing vessels that might have woodworms and all sorts of awful things in them. Um, they look at the waterways because migratory birds land there and we're very concerned about migratory birds carrying things like avian influenza and, and creating pandemics of the, the kind Lisa referred to. Um, but they are brilliant relationships. We have officers that are embedded in those communities as well and they provide us with a really good defence mechanism of surveillance and monitoring for about 7,000 kilometres across the north end of Australia. And I echo Paul's uh, comment, you actually need to embed in the community to get the leverage um, and the, the experience. We're very blessed um, that those relationships have been in place for about 20 years. Um, and as I say, we have officers, uh, we don't call it biosecurity up there, we call it NARC's top watch. And the, the people really relate to that. It's a, a very long term. 
And I think my, my reflection on some of the comments that have been made uh, today is that um, there's a culture change that we need to have in biosecurity. Um, people are always um, uh, looking for uh, how do things get in, how did this happen, how, they do. Uh, the realities they do. A lot of a lot of what comes into Australia comes into Australia, uh, despite uh, everybody's best efforts. Uh, they, it blows in. It comes in on passengers. It, um, it, it might be imported in here. There might be mistakes at the border. Um, I have to say, on behalf of my agency, very few. Um, but the the notion of engaging with the community, the notion of strategic thinking, um, these are these are things that take time. The community's demand from from us is quite often the answer right now. Um, so the community through the government processes, the parliamentary processes, the, the media <laughs> processes is right now, count this, I can understand capability audits, count this, tell us how much of this, how many resources have you shifted from here to here today. Um, some of the things that we've talked about, NARCS has taken 20 years um, to, to, to get up and running. I mean it's been running effectively for, for that time, but it's matured into a very viable thing. Engagement, imagine, imagine us having a chat. <laughs> as opposed to doing a website, wow, um, it, it's very different um, and I think some of, some of what we have to do is take community with us to shift its thinking around the value of some of these things. Um, public service agencies and large industry groups are really good at counting stuff. Um, what does success look like when you're measuring engagement or when you're measuring strategic change um, will be very different. I might take, if there's one more question, you've been an enormously patient group hearing a, a huge diversity um, of, of views and, and perspectives. Anyone have a burning desire? Yeah, go for it. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll open this up to all four of you. Uh, just You're mentioning the topic <coughs> and it just got me thinking about uh, the issues to do with asylum seekers and obviously I don't want to go into all the obvious controversy around that but to Good. what it's <laughs> to, to what extent is uh, quarantine and biosecurity involved in the discussions around managing this issue? Um, our, so I'm not, not going to go anywhere near immigration policy as a, as a very good biosecurity head. Um, our interest in, in the top end is, is really about we understand the high levels of risk um, by virtue of what faces us um, from the north. Arboviruses, great example. Blue tongue, um, screw and fly, all sorts of things that can just fly over. <laughs> they just, they're just going to land in a few. The wind carries seeds. Uh, yes, the boats carry risks as well. Um, think about uh, how we manage the relationships in the Torres Strait. There are islands in the Torres Strait where you can see Papua New Guinea. Um, we manage human health, environmental um, and animal uh, and plant biosecurity up there. We do The fruit fly is, is enormously a, an issue. Um, we have very nice relationships with the traditional owners um, about what they can move uh, in protected state. Um, but there are islands up there where there is foot and mouth disease and we worry about that. Um, with uh, boat arrivals, whether they're illegal or not, um, we're concerned with what's on the boat. Um, quite often the health of the people. Um, we're very concerned about the health of the people and how we manage them. Uh, the boat itself, some of the quality of the, the boats is a bit poor. Um, and our, our colleagues in AFMA, uh, that's the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, work with us to actually manage uh, the, the boats once customs and others have dealt with them. We're part of a border management group um, and our concern is to protect Australia from, from the risks uh, that come with, no matter whether it's a illegal or not boat. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants that. The North, the north is, is one of our biggest... It's big, it's close, um, you know, the, you're very right, the, the closest places are not are not urban Australia. <laughs> I don't know if others want to add. There's no doubt from an emerging infectious disease point of view, the region to the north of Australia is kind of seen as a corridor of threat really. Backbone viruses is another big, probably one of the biggest yeah. emerging infectious disease um, issues for Australia. Um, so we do need to have good systems in place so at a regional level. So Australia's relationship with our near neighbours is very important. And we've got a strong history of international cooperation, yes. and we need to maintain that. Continue great, great relationships between uh, technical people in Australia and offshore, and um, a lot of assistance in terms yep. of samples being sent down from PNG being looked at in our labs. Yep. There's good, good relationships there. Well, if um, 
If you're all done and dusted, can I say, first of all, thank you to three very, very diverse and interesting um, perspectives um, and views. A lot of food for thought for me and I'm sure for, for many of you. And can I also thank you for choosing to come and share uh, this experience um, and join me warmly thanking um, the panel today.